Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium, episode 17, 527 to 532, part 1, The Battle of Dara. As I've hopefully firmly established in your minds, the reign of Justinian is one of the most complicated and incident-filled in the entire history of the Roman Empire. Upon his accession in 527, Justinian moved from being a workaholic behind the scenes to being the workaholic with the power to have his ideas put into practice. The results for us are that the five-year period between 527 and 532 needs to be broken up into several different episodes so that we can fully appreciate what was going on. Today, we begin in a familiar theatre. Over the last two episodes, we've seen the increasingly unstable situation on the empire's eastern front. The Byzantine Empire was not only seen as a superpower by its neighbours, but now as the centre of Christianity. From Ethiopia in the south to the Caucasus Mountains in the north, states were increasingly seeing religion as a strong influence on their political relations with other states. The attempts by the kingdoms of Lazica and Iberia to switch allegiance to Byzantium were partly motivated by the antagonistic stance of the Persian state toward Christianity. Understandably, the Persians were wary that Christians might represent some kind of fifth column within their realm, and the turbulence stirred up by Mazdak within the Zoroastrian world was seen by some as a response to the success of Christianity at winning converts. However, religion is seldom the sole motivation for political actions. Lazica and Iberia were small kingdoms on the Persian doorstep, who saw an alliance with the more distant Byzantines as the route to an independent existence. Similarly, Justin may have told Kavad that he was bound to support these kingdoms as they sought to help their people get closer to the one true God, But naturally, there were other considerations. The Byzantines didn't want the Persians to have access to the Black Sea. The security and wealth of Constantinople depended on controlling the approaches to it. Of course, the Persians probably weren't thinking on such a grand scale. Their stated demands remained cash and the destruction of the fort at Dara. Today we are going to do something a little different, and focus on one battle in particular, rather than simply survey the sweep of the war. With Procopius soon to arrive on the Eastern Front, we have a rare chance to see soldiers in action through his eyes, and learn how battle in the Age of Cavalry had come to be organised. Remember, though, that we only know all the details you're about to hear from Procopius, who, as we've already established, has many an axe to grind, and ear to please. In episodes 5 and 11, I made reference to a catastrophic defeat which the Persians suffered in battle with the White Huns, or Hephthalites, in 484. While Attila had been building his empire in Europe, the Hephthalites constructed their own vast domain, which today would extend from the western edge of China across Pakistan, Afghanistan, and north up into Kazakhstan. Their raiding tactics were similar to the Huns, or the Bulgars more recently in our story, and by 484 the Persian king Peroz had raised a massive army to meet them and destroy them on his northern border. Peroz himself lined up with the cream of the Persian military, the Immortals. These heavy cavalry had been in the front line on the plains near Herat, and charged the lightly armoured Hephthalite horse archers. The Hephthalites had fled, and the Persians roared after them. But as was so often the case with armies from the steppes, their retreat was actually a trap. The Hephthalites had dug a large trench across the plain, and concealed it. They left one crossing in the centre, which they quickly retreated across. The Persians fanned out to encircle their prey, and with dust rising ever thicker from the hooves of their great steeds, 
they did not see what awaited them. The front lines dropped out of sight and into the pits, and many behind them couldn't pull up in time and simply followed their comrades down, crushing those beneath them. Among the dead was Peroz, and in the aftermath, the dignity of the Sassanid royal house was insulted by the levying of tribute to the victorious Hephthalites. It was this double humiliation that pressed on Kavad to begin his war with Anastasius in 502. By winning great victories over the Roman Empire, Kavad could restore his prestige while also grabbing the necessary cash to pay his benefactors. Although Anastasius had managed to push the Persians back, Kavad could feel fairly happy with the campaign of the early 6th century. He had sacked Amida and several other cities, and Byzantine slaves and gold were in his hands. The Byzantines had been forced to fight a defensive war, which left the Persians feeling that their western border was pretty secure. This is where the problem of Dara comes in. You'll recall from the history of Rome that the last serious war between Rome and Persia was launched by Julian the Apostate in 363. The emperor was killed and the Romans were forced to cede territory to the Persians. This included the large fortress of Nisbis, which you can still find on the map from episode 11. Nisbis was strategically vital because it was one of the few points on the border between the two great empires where the land was suitable for large armies. To the north were the Armenian mountains and beyond them the Caucasus where Iberia and Lazica lay. As long as you built a fort to guard the mountain passes, it was pretty difficult for an enemy army to pass through those areas and keep themselves supplied. The same was true for the south, where the Syrian desert would make life pretty harsh for any invasion force, not to mention the newly minted Lakhmid Arab kingdom. So in between these natural barriers, on a route which led one way to Antioch and the other way to Tessaphon, lay Nisbis. From their battlements, the Persians could look out and feel confident that the Byzantines were nowhere near and that their homelands were secure. Of course, from a Byzantine point of view, this was a strategic weakness, and after the invasion of 502, it was hard to feel like having an armed Persian camp on the border really made them feel very secure. So Anastasius had ordered the construction of a fortress over the village of Dara, opposite Nisbis, on the Byzantine side. Now, when the Persians looked across the plain, they would see an armed camp staring right back at them. It seems like a classic arms race. The Byzantines felt this equality would help ensure peace. The Persians felt it was an aggressive move designed to threaten their security. With all of that in mind, it's easy to see why the battle over Iberia and Lazica that broke out in 527 soon spiralled into war which would encompass the whole frontier. As the Persians got the better of the fighting in the north, Justinian ordered an attack to commence further south. Offensives against Nisbis and Thabatha were unsuccessful, although raids into Persian Armenia did manage to bring back a few slaves. During the winter, Hypatius was dispatched once more to try and arrange peace talks with Kavad. The king restated his demands for gold to pay for the defence of the passes through the Caucasus Mountains, but Justinian refused. There was sensitivity on the Byzantine side at the idea of paying tribute to the Persians, which is how many viewed the demand for cash. The Persian argument was that the money was no different than similar amounts given to federate troops or foreign allies who defended the Danube. So the war escalated in 528 and 529, with bad results for the Byzantines. The Persians steadily eroded their position on the Lazican border, while a successful raid on Persian territory in Mesopotamia brought a fearsome response from Al-Munthar of the Lakhmids. After killing the local dukes in battle, he raided deep into imperial territory, ravaging the lands around Emesa, Apamea, and even into the territory of Antioch. On his way home, he had captured many slaves, including around 400 nuns, 
who he promptly sacrificed to the goddess al Uzza, who was likened to Aphrodite by Greek contemporaries. Even to pre-Christian Roman eyes, this would have been seen as a monstrous act. As we shall see over the next couple of episodes, one of Justinian's solutions to any problem was to build. He sent men to fortify cities along the border, but several drew Persian attacks, which prevented the work crews from completing their tasks. At Thanuris, it was Belisarius, who we will soon introduce fully, who was guarding the men. With a Persian army in the vicinity, reinforcements were sent in to join him under the command of two Balkan-born brothers, Buzis and Kutsis. They are described as young and rash by Procopius, and so it proved. The Persians arrived with a large army, and, learning from Peroz's fate, dug trenches in the desert, before luring the excitable Byzantine commanders into a headlong attack. Once more, men and horses flew into the unseen ditch to be killed. Kutsis was amongst them and now it was the turn of the Persians to look down on their cunning with pride. Although there were casualties on the Persian side too, it was unmistakably their victory, and although Belisarius and the other commanders were able to retreat, the Persians took many prisoners, and the foundations of the new fortress were destroyed. Justinian clearly needed to act. First came a major reorganisation of the Eastern Army. Clearly, one field army was not enough to push back the Persians and the Lachmids, so fresh troops were drafted from the west, and a second field army, the Army of Armenia, was established with around 15,000 men. To the south, the Army of the East would now be about 20,000 strong. New commands were also created in towns and cities across the east, with noblemen from Constantinople hastily shoved out the door to help shore up the border. New commanders were promoted too, and Justinian turned to two Balkan-born men, like himself, Sitas and Belisarius. The two young men had come to the emperor's attention when he was serving as master of the precental armies, and they were part of his personal bodyguard. These guards would swear oaths of loyalty to their commander and might be asked to take on confidential missions or even stand in the presence of their master while he ate his meals. Sitas had clearly made a favourable impression on his master because during the late 520s he'd been tasked with subduing the mountain-dwelling Tsani of northeast Anatolia, bringing them onto the tax rolls and conscripting their men into the army. His successful leadership had also won him personal favour, as marriage was arranged to Theodora's sister Comito, making him, essentially, part of the family. He was now promoted to Magister Militum in charge of the Armenian army and based at Theodosiopolis. Belisarius was younger still, and may have been as young as 25 when given important commands in the east. Born in Thrace, it's probable that Belisarius was from a minor noble family, as his first assignments seemed to be as a cavalry officer, and he clearly impressed everyone around him with his maturity and judgment. Belisarius was now promoted to be Magister Militum for the East, arguably the most important command in the Empire. It's at this point that Procopius was hired to be his legal secretary and who made his way to Dara, to join his master. Justinian couldn't rest there, though. He ordered more building work with improved fortifications for Martyropolis and Theodosiopolis. The abandoned streets of Palmyra were to be rebuilt to station troops. And in light of what Al-Munthar had just done, the monastery of St. Sabas had a fort built around it. The Lachmids were becoming a pressing threat. Unlike their Persian sponsors, the Arab raiders could move too fast to be easily fought, and their raids were becoming ever more disturbing. So Justinian sent envoys into the Syrian desert. They sought out the leader of the largest Christian tribe in the area, 
the Ghassanids, and asked if they would be interested in becoming Byzantine clients. In exchange for cash and the title of Supreme Phylarch, which could be seen as simply chieftain, but king would not be inaccurate, the leader of the Ghassanids, Al-Harith ibn Jabala, was charged with protecting the Christian people of the eastern provinces and wherever possible, inflicting as much damage on the pagan Lachmids as he could. Al-Harith was given authority over the whole area, from the Euphrates down to the Red Sea. He didn't currently hold that sway, and so as the Lachmids had done, he now set about using his money and muscle to bring fellow tribes into the fold and organize the defense of the Byzantine border. The empowering of a people who once the imperial authorities would have ignored was seen as an unprecedented move by Procopius. But the times, they were a-changing, and Justinian needed help patrolling his southern border. As with Aksum and Lysica and Iberia, it was Christianity that allowed him to put his faith in the Ghassanids and not be fearful what arming and paying a huge group of men on his doorstep might lead to. Of course, I should mention that the Ghassanids were Monophysites, but Justinian was not in a position to be picky. So at last, we come to a halt at the gates of Dara. If a new fortress couldn't be built, then Justinian would settle for upgrades to his existing stronghold. In late 529, Kavad sent a letter to Justinian, telling him that he needed gold. He gave him notice that war was coming, and tried to guilt-trip Justinian into seeing his point of view. Look at all the innocent people on the border who are going to be killed because of your refusal to pay what you owe. Justinian assumed that negotiations would continue, but Kavad was serious, and after a string of victories, he was confident that he could push the new emperor's armies back and get the peace that he wanted. Work at Dara continued throughout the first half of 530, with Belisarius eyeing the horizon. News reached him that a huge Persian army was gathering at Nisbis, determined to destroy the illegal fortress once and for all. Although much faith had been placed in the young general, his youth was on the emperor's mind, and the master of offices, Hermogenes, was sent to lend the general his experience in the coming battle. By June, the Persians made their appearance. An army 40,000 strong began to gather outside the gates of Nisbis. Amongst the army were 5,000 of the immortals. Their horses were draped in armour, while their rider wore iron plates, greaves and gloves, and carried whips and maces, and a lance so heavy that it had to first be attached to the side of the horse's mount. Most strikingly of all, the rider wore a one-piece helmet, crafted to look like a man's face. A striking sight to behold, no doubt, and their presence made it clear how important the coming conflict was to the King of Kings. The Persian commander, Feroz, also brought with him a train of artillery, sappers, engineers, and other weaponry ready for a siege and the raising of Dara. Belisarius had with him the Army of the East, about 25,000 men strong, but only recently formed with new recruits from the West that weren't used to one another yet. Belisarius's personal retinue, or comitatus, was only 1,500 strong, and heavy cavalry though they were, they could not match the immortals for training, equipment, or skill. Belisarius knew that the earlier defeats he had witnessed were not just due to superior Persian numbers or the rashness of men like Kutsis. No, it was superior Persian organization and discipline in mounted warfare that had often been the key to victory. The Byzantines may have learnt how to ride and shoot arrows at the same time, but they were new to this game. The Persians were centuries ahead of them in institutional experience. 
The Roman army, though, was hardly known as an undisciplined force, and Belisarius was a commander of rare vision who was able to get the most out of what he had and use his enemy's strengths against them. On hearing of the size of the Persian force, he knew that Dara would not hold out against a prolonged siege, and made the decision to fight out on the plain outside the walls. There were two advantages Belisarius felt his army had over their enemy. The first was that the Persian infantry were no match for the Byzantines. He dismisses them as merely the servants of the noblemen riding the horses. As a large part of the Persian army were infantry, their numerical advantage may not have been as overwhelming as it might seem. The second advantage were the federate troops serving the Byzantines. The army of the east had two contingents of particularly fearsome barbarians from north of the Danube. The first were some Herulians, riders originally from Scandinavia, who were good horsemen and had been particularly strong warriors in Attila's armies. Procopius claims they were the basest of men and utterly abandoned rascals. The other group were actual Huns, steppe horse archers whose reputation for their deadly arrow fire preceded them. In order to make best use of his forces, and attempt to overcome their numerical inferiority, Belisarius chose a strategy which the Persians were now entirely familiar with. Outside the walls of Dara, he ordered the digging of a trench. This was not to be a concealed trap, though. This trench was very much to be seen by the enemy. You can see the shape of the trench and the disposition of each side's army on the map I've posted at the history of Byzantium.wordpress.com. The trench was not a straight line. It looks to us more like a hockey goal, with two right angles at the end of a straight line, and then two more straight lines continuing away parallel to the first. The motivation for digging these trenches was to protect the infantry from being crushed by the Persian heavy cavalry. Belisarius made sure that the enemy scouts would see the pits he had dug and hoped that they would ensure that the Persian cavalry would steer clear of the centre of his line. Behind the central line of the trench, he placed himself, Hermogenes, and the infantry. The Byzantine cavalry would sit behind the two other parallel trenches and there were points where one could cross the ditches. It wasn't just a giant hole in the ground. But why the hockey goal shape, you ask? In the mouth of the goal, as it were, he placed his Huns. With ditches jutting out in front of them, they were unlikely to be charged by the Persians, but would maintain manoeuvrability, which was one of their key strengths. The heralds were placed on the dip of a hill on the left side of the line, concealed from view under their commander, Faras. The Persians duly split their forces in three in response to this, with infantry in the middle and cavalry on each wing. With his army assembled, Feroz began proceedings by sending Belisarius a note. In it, he asked if the Byzantine general would be so kind as to prepare him a meal and a bath in Dara for the next day. No doubt chuckling to himself, Feroz spent the first day discussing tactics with his officers, and perhaps debating what exactly Belisarius was up to with all his ditch digging. Procopius reports that to keep the Byzantines occupied, Feroz sent some men down to their line who challenged the soldiers to single combat. The next day, 10,000 more Persians arrived from Nisbis, giving Firoz a two-to-one numerical advantage. Belisarius sent a note to Firoz, telling him not to go to war without justification. Firoz replied that that would be good counsel from an honest man, but from a lying Byzantine, it meant nothing. Belisarius replied that the insulting letter would be fastened to the banners of his men for extra motivation. On the third day, the battle began. The Persians advanced and poured volleys of arrows across the trenches. 
The Byzantines returned fire, but the larger Persian numbers meant it was the Byzantines who were on the defensive, maintaining discipline behind their shields as the arrows rained down upon them. When each side had used up its arrows, the infantry used their spears hand to hand, although the Byzantine centre was well protected from direct attack by the ditches. The Byzantine left began taking heavy casualties, and the regular Persian cavalry advanced against that wing who were commanded by Buzis, doubtless with revenge on his mind. Once within a hundred yards, the Persians drew up in formation, ready to charge, and the Byzantines withdrew, rapidly. So rapidly, that the Persians galloped forward, believing that they could turn the whole army in on itself. As had happened at Herat fifty years earlier, though, the Persians began to lose cohesion, and with dust flying into the air, they didn't see what awaited them as they rounded the trench in pursuit of the fleeing Byzantines. The Huns, in the left side of the goal, now sprinted out and around the trench, smashing into the Persian flanks. Meanwhile, Buzis led his men past the hill, and as the Persians raced to catch them, the heralds burst out of their position and smashed into their other flank. Turning to face two enemies on your sides is an impossible task, and with the mad press of men and horse, 2,000 Persians were dead within 20 minutes. Those who escaped fled back to their lines, with Boozies leading the pursuit. With the left wing disappearing into a cloud of dust and confusion, the Persian immortals, under the command of Berus Manus, were harassing the outnumbered Byzantine right. Again, the Byzantines broke and fled, but this time they darted back towards the walls of Dara and behind the trench, so that the Persians headed straight toward the Byzantine infantry. Belisarius was ready for them, and prepared a wall of shields to block their path. Once they passed the edge of the trench, the Huns on the right of the Goalmouth raced into action. With the speed and horsemanship that only a life in the saddle can give you, the Huns curved around the trench and into the Persian rear. Like a barn door swinging shut, The Huns bore down on the exposed backs of the Persian cavalry, firing arrows at point-blank range. Even the armour of the immortals could not protect them. As if this wasn't enough, Belisarius' reserve cavalry arrived on their flank, and the other group of Huns soon returned, almost surrounding the Persian cavalry. They were cut down in their thousands as they tried to escape. Procopius estimates that 5,000 died on this wing alone, with Berus Menas among the slain. Those who could escape raced away at top speed. The Persian infantry, realising what had happened, also began to flee, many dropping their shields and making a run for Nisbis. The Byzantines pursued and cut hundreds down as they fled. The temptation at this moment of victorious slaughter would have been to surge forward away from the trenches and attempt to storm the rest of the Persian army, who were standing gobsmacked across the plain. But Belisarius had learnt his lessons, and gave the order to quickly abandon the pursuit rather than risk losing men in the chaos that would have followed. Belisarius had won the first significant Byzantine victory of the war, and he wasn't going to squander it. The Battle of Dara is perhaps more significant to historians than to history. As we shall see next episode, one victory does not win a war. But for those charting the change in military tactics and personnel, Procopius' account shows us the completely different way of war from the classical image of Roman legionaries standing on foot, wearing their enemies down. In Belisarius, the Byzantines had found a commander who understood the new realities of warfare and the Byzantines' own diminished position. It's worth saying that the bias of the people of the Mediterranean was still firmly in the infantry camp. Tales of Homeric heroism fill Procopius' pages, and he feels the need to mount a defence of why Belisarius' use of horse archers is not a cowardly move. But once we sift through the stuff his audience demanded, we get to the picture of a world where cavalry was king, 
and protecting these vital assets was of paramount importance. By using ditches to control the field of battle, Belisarius had put the Persians on notice that the Roman army was still a force to be reckoned with. However, the war will rumble on in two weeks' time, as we continue on the Eastern Front, before swinging west to see how the years 527 to 532 affected the Danube frontier. In case you're interested, I have put two links up at the History of Byzantium, wordpress.com to give you more information about the Battle of Dara. One is a link to the BBC TV show Time Commanders, where they recreate the battle, and the other is to an excellent site called The Art of Battle, where a moving PowerPoint presentation shows you the development of the battle. Thank you so much for listening, and for your feedback on iTunes, Facebook, and at the History of Byzantium.wordpress.com. Happy New Year, everyone.